Thank you for watching BAF TV, your choice for quality religious and information educational programming. This concludes our broadcast day. In the next 15 seconds, we will be transitioning to the Oddity Archive. Please turn on your circa 1984D scrambler box to enjoy the following programming. If you do not comply, proper authorities will be notified. The Oddity Archive will now be switching into scrambled mode. And welcome to the Oddity Archive. The show that... Oh, what the hell? Excuse me. There we are. Anyway, where was I? Okay, I'm gonna come flat out and say it. This episode won't make any sense without some backstory. Meaning you're gonna have to sit through one of my history lessons first. I'm sorry, sorry. I'll try and keep it brief. Dating all the way back to the late 40s, there had been a few markets with quote-unquote cable TV. It was meant as a means for people living in valleys and remote areas where decent TV reception was hard to come by. The purpose of this cable was so you could watch TV. Simple as that. Fast forward to 1965 and Time Life, you know, the people that make those soft hits of the 70s compilations, became a partner in Sterling Manhattan Cable, helping offer, in Lower Manhattan only, one of these early cable TV services. As I implied, there were no cable networks yet. By way of the Sterling Manhattan partnership, Time Life had been an investor in a proposed exclusively for-pay TV network called the Green Channel, which never materialized. By 1972, the Green Channel warped into the first pay TV network, Home Box Office, or HBO. Yes, that HBO. It premiered on November 8th of that year, and was only available in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. From there, everything spread. New networks like TBS were added, and by the end of the decade, cable TV as we know it had begun in many places. However, some major markets like L.A. and Chicago held out on allowing such a thing, citing a fear of monopolies. Or maybe it was just local politics. Anyway, this brings us to today's topic. I think that's a record for longest intro. Anyway, non-cable or satellite, pay TV. These holdout markets relied on, save for Chicago, more on that later, single-channel, HBO-styled pay TV services such as Preview, Spectrum, and most famously On TV, which existed from 1977 to 1985. On TV closed when Chicago, the last major city in the U.S. without regular cable, finally buckled and allowed standard cable TV. The idea of these types of channels was to partially buy out an existing, usually high-numbered UHF station, and for part of each day, i.e. afternoons and nights, air a variety of movies, sports, music, and yes, pornography. Seems to be a recurring theme around here. Anyway, with your subscription, you'd receive a very simple descrambler box. Perhaps too simple. The box had a single switch on it with two settings, on and off, and that was it. This led to the biggest problem with these services, piracy. Any viewers illegally using other decoders will see and hear this. It didn't take long for electronics geeks to figure out that these early descrambler boxes were shockingly primitive. To scramble a TV signal, all the broadcaster had to do was introduce a 15 hertz sine wave into the video signal, which caused TVs to lose their grip on the picture. 
Some carriers would also shift the audio signal for added protection. But at its heart, all the descrambler boxes did was cut that rogue frequency. That's it. With a little know-how and a few cheap parts from Radio Shack, folks were able to receive the pay TV signals for free. More enterprising pirates sold their homemade boxes for what amounted to a few months' subscription with no further costs. By the time anybody thought to fight the pirates, we're talking 1984 here, Chicago was the only major town left that hadn't started allowing normal cable TV. Nonetheless, On TV added an additional layer of encryption to their broadcasts, which caused homemade descramblers to play broadcasted alarm noises and legal warnings. Presently, your On TV signal is being electronically scrambled because the decoder box in your home is unauthorized. This is a polite way of saying that you are now committing an illegal act. We are well aware that in all probability, you are normally a law-abiding citizen. However, by possessing an unauthorized decoder box, you are, whether you realize it or not, a criminal in violation of both federal and state law. However, it was a case of too little too late. About a year later, the city of Chicago finally allowed its first cable TV system, and On TV died in May of 1985. There were a couple of markets with cable and pay TV services, but the pay TV services simply couldn't hold on. By the end of 1985, pay TV was largely over. Only one carrier lasted beyond 1985, and that's Select TV, which covered Sacramento, California. Although Sacramento belatedly got cable in 1987, Select TV somehow lasted until 1991. For a single channel of faux cable TV, these pay services were expensive. Services began at $20 per month and ran up to about $35. You also had to pay for installation, and extra for special events like concerts and boxing matches, and for adult programming, of course. With that in mind, it wasn't all that unusual for these pay TV carriers to run into legal issues and frequent complaints most notably from parents who'd catch their kids watching R-rated movies, or more frequently, porn, often through the scrambled feed. On a related note, On TV's Fort Lauderdale, Florida branch was known to air hardcore pornography during the overnight hours as part of their adults-only service. Just saying. Of course, pay TV had already been around for some time, so the FCC had already issued an amended definition of the term public airwaves, which now included the words in the clear. In other words, if the average non-paying viewer could not clearly see and hear the offending program, it was legal in the eyes of the government. So the lawsuits and complaints, by and large, went nowhere. And the cable saga marches on and on and on. After 19 years, do you have cable? How long will you wait, Sacramento? Well, wait no longer. Get Select TV in your home now. See over 70 different movies each and every month, without commercials, without editing. And if by chance you switch to cable within a year, we'll refund your standard installation fee. You have nothing to lose, so call 366-6060. That's 366-6060. Once again, entrepreneurs were in a frenzy to figure out a way around no cable in certain markets, all the while circumventing piracy issues and trying to cool Hollywood's fears about this whole home video thing to boot. This led to easily the worst pay TV service of them all. I'm talking about Telefirst. Only running in Chicago, surprise, surprise, from January 17th until June 30th of 1984, six nights a week after local ABC affiliate WLS signed off, a, shall we say, more complex edition of On TV or Spectrum, etc., would come over the airwaves for four hours. Telefirst at first glance seemed like a good idea. Every night, Telefirst would air one or two recent movies and some miscellaneous lifestyle programs. The idea being that you'd record them on your VCR for subsequent viewing. Well, Hollywood, which still hadn't quite warmed up to the video rental industry, wanted a safeguard. Your descrambler box, imagine that, another one, would act as a link to your VCR, meaning the encrypted signal would pass onto your Betamax or VHS or Telefunken Ted or whatever. This in turn meant that when Telefirst would change the scrambling code sent to your box, which was supposedly once a month, but I have my suspicions, you could no longer watch your tapes. 
Unless, that is, you'd figure out a way around it. I wonder, if I had two VCRs in an RF box... Nah, I'll just rent the movies. Another problem was that Telefirst programming was always scrambled. The descrambler box was meant as a decoder for your VCR. So if you happened to be up late at night and ready to watch your movie live over the air, you couldn't. It was totally dependent on your tapes. Also, I hope you were prepared to do a little fine-tuning on your descrambler box, preferably every time. Or you could try and do it in the precious few minutes before launch that Telefirst wasn't scrambled. But most people didn't want to stay up all night to fight with their descramblers. Lazy. Yet another problem is, Telefirst tended not to show movies every night, and invariably the movies they did show would be box office bombs that the studios were still trying to recoup their losses on. Oh yeah, and another problem, if you didn't record several minutes of extra footage on both ends of the night's broadcast, you wouldn't get the proper codes for proper playback onto your tape. Ooh, I, I got another one. Say you want to rewind or fast forward to another point in your recording? Well, I hope you're prepared to wait an extra 60 seconds for the descrambler to catch up with itself and sit through a scrambled feed of your show while you wait, most likely missing the part you were looking for to begin with. And for the proverbial cherry on top, remember how I mentioned that they'd pad their airtime with miscellaneous stuff? Since Telefirst usually could only fit in one movie per night, when they bothered to do so, that is, you'd find yourself saddled with lots of odds and ends, like bad foreign cooking shows. So, tell me true. Would you want to pay the not-so-low price of $25.95 a month, plus tape costs, for what in the end amounted to this? This why, oh, why didn't this catch on? Oh, did I mention that your $25.95 a month only allowed you to pick four movies for the entire month? That you had to pick in advance? Really? <sighs> Would you believe that ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, that is, was the one that bankrolled this little endeavor? And would you believe that if this service was successful, they intended to go national? Cocaine was one hell of a drug, wasn't it? Well, drugs are the only thing I can think of to make someone believe that this was somehow a practical idea. Well, if there was one thing in all this that I can believe in, it's that only about 4,000 people ever subscribed to Telefirst. Well, that does it for today's archive. Join us next time when we discuss why the 8-track deserved better. <clears throat> yeah, right. Thank <laughs> you.